have a lot of respect for the way they respond to the word of God. They allow God to change and say, you know what? I know that I have, I've got some wrong in this and I'm willing to own that and I'm willing to take that. You guys were a little fired up. Today, um, well, we were talking about the enemy's attacks, his tactics to kind of stop God's work. And, and we went through some of those. There was everything from anger to, uh, to uh, verbal threats to physical violence. There, those are things that we as God's people need to be prepared for and kind of ready for. But, but the big question I wanted to bring to you this morning is, did any of those stop God's work, right? If you read Nehemiah, did, did those things stop the work of God? It did not. They, they, what did they do? They were carrying a sword in one, a trowel in the other hand, and they're just continuing to work while they're defending themselves. I mean, it was crazy. Those types of attacks from outside do not stop the work of God. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about that. Um, so I've been in uh, vocational ministry now for, well, as a pastor, 25 years. I've been in ministry for 30. And I've seen a lot of churches, and I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of politics in church, and I've seen a lot of, I've seen some church split stuff. I've seen a lot, of, I mean, some of you, if you've been in a church a long time, you've seen that kind of stuff, right? And I was trying to think, I was trying to think of one time in my lifetime, or even in history that I'd read, where the enemy went after a church, and the church split. Or a time when, when, uh, when the enemies or those outside of the church came at the church, and uh, they were carrying pitchforks, or they were slandering the church, or they were doing something, and they were attacking the church. One time when that happened, and a bunch of people in a church just picked up and left. I can't think of a single time in history where that happens. The work of God does not stop because, because the world is pressing in and the devil and his schemes is coming. That never happens. It never, ever happens. In fact, when that happens and they start attacking, right? What ha we have an example of it in the book of Acts in the Bible. The disciples, they all get arrested because they're preaching the gospel, right? So they arrest them all, throw them all in jail. And then they get brought in front of the trial, and they're in court, and Peter's their, their main guy, and he talks, and he gives a defense. And then one of the guys is a leader, and he says, listen, you know, we, we probably ought to let him go, but, you know, this is. A... And so it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 40, it says, his speech persuaded them. That's talking about Peter. Persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. You know what a flogging is? That's where they take all the disciples and they take these whips with, with bone and metal and they just, like Jesus, they, they, they whip them severely. All 12 of them get just a, a lashing. It says they called the apostles in and they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. That's, that's external, isn't it? That, that's external. That is the devil. That is physical violence. We talked about that last time. It says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They left there, their blood running down their legs and down their arms, but they are just praising God. God, thank you so much that I got to, got to experience that for you. God, thank you so much. They're rejoicing day after day in the temple courts and from house to house. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They just kept going. Actually, they were more invigorated and more excited once the, the enemy started to attack them. They're like, oh, come on now. You want some of that? Right? That's what's going on. They're getting excited, and the Holy Spirit is, is filling them. In Nehemiah, they're invigorated, and the work is continuing. And you go, well, that's great. The work continues until chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a sad commentary. We're going to read about chapter 5. Because in chapter 5, the work stops completely. It comes to a complete halt. You're like, well, geez, they were being attacked by people, all this kind of stuff, and now they're going to stop? It's because there was internal conflict within the group. There was internal conflict in the group, right? We get that in church too. Every church division that I've seen, every church that's split, 
every one of those cases I told you where a, a group of people picked up and left, it's never because the outside world comes in and attacks them. It is always because somebody in the church is offended by something, somebody doesn't like something, somebody feels left out, they didn't like the way you talk to them, um, they didn't like the decision the pastor made, they didn't like what the elders said, they don't like the color of the carpet, it's the wrong shade of red. I'm not exaggerating, churches have split over the shade of red or the shade of color of carpet. That's how ridiculous this is. And so what I want you to understand, I'll throw this on the screen. If you got your notes, you can follow along. God's work is stopped by conflict between God's people more than external attacks. It's, it's stopped, God's work is stopped by conflicts between, between God's people more than external attacks. Let's look at it. Let's look at it in Nehemiah chapter one. Open up to it. I've got it right here. And the conflict that they're going to have centers on four different complaints that they've got. Now, we probably, I would be surprised if we had this particular type of complaint and this type of issue in here, because I don't know that we've got a ton of rich people in the church, right? We're just kind of all normal cats, right? And here you've got some rich folks that are in there, and there's some, there's some problems. But watch this. It says, we and our sons, verse 1, we and our sons and daughters are numerous, in order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Okay, that's how this starts. This is the first complaint. There's a group of people, and they come to Nehemiah, and they say this. Listen, we got a bunch of kids, and we can't put food on the table. We can't do this. And, and you say, well, what is that about? Well, what's happening is that they all had normal jobs, right? So this guy's working at Dairy Queen. This guy's working over here. This guy's working at the grain mill or whatever. They all have their regular jobs, but now they're, t they're not working their hours. They're not working those jobs, and they've been trying, because the work of God is so important, and so they're pouring into this work. But they didn't all of a sudden, once this work came, all of a sudden not, not have nine kids. They still have nine kids, Right? They still have to feed these kids, and so they're struggling, and they're trying to figure out, and, and if you've been in ministry, you know this. I've been through this, trying to figure out, man, how are we going to work this? How are we going to pay to survive in the midst of actually doing ministry? Because i gotta, I got to figure this out, right? So, I mean, I worked a separate job when I was a, a church planter, and I, I did real estate. So I did something in order, we had, you have to figure things out in order to pay for it. And they're struggling with that. And so they bring that to him. Well, it goes on and it says, others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. So we find something else out. They're in the middle of a famine. You know what that means? It's not raining. There's no rain. They planted crops and it won't rain. And so there's a big concern. What's going to happen? And they're not getting any yields and they're not able to they're not able to promise corn. They're not able to promise anything. They're not able to do that. And so they're left in a bad position that they say the only way we're going to eat is we have to come up with some money and the only thing we have is our homes. And so they begin to mortgage their homes, some of these people do. You ever think about doing that? Going to pull out some mortgage? Just take out a mortgage on your house so that you can eat. That's what these people are doing. Why? Because they're passionate about the work. They believe that God wants them to build this. But it's putting them in a major, major problem. Got to eat. It reminds me a little bit of the housing crisis of 2008. Man, now I went, I don't know how many of you were affected by that, but I was majorly affected by that because I worked in real estate at the time. Right? And they were making bad loans. Right? They were making loans that weren't good. You were, you were making loans that you knew that person really couldn't pay because you didn't even ask them how much money you made. Right? You'd say, well, how much do you make? You know, say, well, I make $200,000 a year. And they say, well, are you sure you don't make $500,000 a year? No, I make $200,000. We'll just say that you make five hundred. dollars And they'd write that down, and they would give them a loan for a house that's way more than they could possibly afford because the bank was like, this property is going to be worth a lot as it goes because the properties are going up. We don't care if you can pay for it. We're happy to take the house. And so it's a similar situation here because what's happening is they're building the walls of Jerusalem. These are, these are properties that are very low in value. But all of a sudden you're building up Jerusalem and you build the city and what's going to happen? People are moving in. The values are going to go up. And what does that mean? There's an opportunity for somebody to scam you and somebody to take advantage of you. And that's a bad thing. It says, still others were saying, verse 4, 
We have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. So it's unlike America where people are having trouble and they just decide they're just going to bail them out. And they're, oh, wait, you know what? We'll just give you a check for $4,800. They don't do that. The king says, no, I want to still live in the lap of luxury and do what I want. So I'm going to continue to tax you through the brain. Right? So they continue to tax them. And so the taxes are bad. And so not only do they not have food, but they also got to pay the king's taxes. And, it's, it's, and so now they're in more problem. And so they're mortgaging their houses. But then when they mortgage their house, they've got to have collateral, right? They've got to have collateral, right? And so they're trying to pull more money out than the property. And so what do they do? Although we are the same flesh and blood, as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been slaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. So we've mortgaged those properties. We've mortgaged our farms, but now we've needed to take more money, and in order, in order to pay for that, we've had to put in more collateral, and the only thing we have is, I'll let you have my child as a slave if I can't pay this off. That's how they would pay debts. You would become a slave to some. I'll let you have my daughter. And so now they can't pay the debt. And so these people, these wicked people are foreclosing on them and taking their kids and taking their homes and taking their property. You say, well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? That's just business, right? It's just business, right? No, that's extortion. Because when there's a disaster like a famine, there's a disaster like a flood, there's a disaster like a hurricane down in Florida, anything like that, there's always people looking to take advantage. There's always some scumbag that's sitting in the corner on his computer when they're collecting money for for the Red Cross that's got his own 50 websites that he's collecting money saying he's the Red Cross, but he's really just taking advantage of people, right? There's always people. They come out of the woodwork for this. Here's the problem in this case. These people that are taking advantage, they're in their own church. They're their own Israelites. These aren't people from the outside that are taking advantage of these families. There are a few rich families in this church, a few rich people that are in this group of Israelites, and they see the rest of their fellow family members in their church. They see them struggling, and they're like, oh, I'll help you out. You know, I'll give you a loan, right? Because I got plenty of money. I'll give you a loan, and then I'm going to charge you 12% interest on that loan in the middle of a famine. It says 1%, and it's per month, so it's 12 over the year. And so you've got people within the church that are, that are taking advantage of other people in the church and it's causing, it's causing division. It's causing, causing friction, right? Because you can't treat family that way. What's happened is though the majority of the congregation, though the majority of the people in the congregation have given of themselves so sacrificially, there are a few that are stopping God's work by their own sinful actions. There's a few. Did you know that the work of God in the church are, the work of God can be stopped completely by just a few people? Did you know that? You can have 99% of your people in harmony, going after that vision, really seeking it uh, in the spirit, all in harmony, and have just a couple of people that aren't, and it can stop the ministry completely. I'll tell you what, for me as a pastor, I, am, I talked a lot last week about the things that the world is doing, the struggles that we're going to have and that we're facing. I am not concerned about those, really. We'll just go through. We'll go through it, right? We'll go through it. We'll stand together. We'll go through it. I'm not worried about that affecting the church or stopping the church from its, from its mission. I'm not concerned about that. We shouldn't be concerned about that. We're just going to stand for God. We're going to continue to go forward. Everything will be fine, Right? And if we suffer for it, we suffer for it. That's just how it is. But that's not going to stop the church from being the church. That's not going to stop the church from ministering and being what God wants it to be. It's not going to stop us from the great commission. It's not going to stop us from the great commandment. It's not going to stop us from loving people. It's not going to stop us from preaching the gospel. It's not going to do that. What will is a conflict within the body. 
within the church. That can stop it. If you look at, and so what they're doing, these guys are extorting their fellow. It's actually a sin. It's actually written in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. I'll, I'll read it to you. Chapter 25, verses, uh, verse 35, and I'll probably read on to 38. It says, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and stranger so they can continue to live among you. Right, if somebody's struggling, you don't put more burden on them so that they have to leave. Right? That's, not, that's not the way you do it, right? And he's like, don't do that. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God so that you may continue to live, they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them food at profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be God. To be your God. Now, what it's saying, it, it's saying this is when you have a person that is poor. You have a person that is really struggling. They can't make ends meet, right? This isn't saying that you can't sell something to somebody in the church at a profit. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that when you got somebody who is down, you can't kick them in the face. They're your brother, right? You can't take their children like I can't go and take your kid as a slave because I might happen to have a little bit more money at the time can't do that right the fact that this even has to be in the book of leviticus is kind of ridiculous to me like you don't know that you don't you don't know within your heart that it's wrong to like when somebody's struggling to to beat them up worse especially if they're your brother they're in your family right they're in your church and so when a fellow child of god is poor and struggling it's wrong to use that as an opportunity for personal gain you don't use that for personal gain you're like, all right, well, I'm going to help, and I'll do what I can. And, and here's the argument that Nehemiah makes. Watch this argument that he makes. He says, I didn't free these people so that they could be enslaved by you. Here, here, here's what's happened, is why are they in this situation anyway? They're in this situation because they had been taken captives by the Babylonians, right? The Jews had all been taken captive by the Babylonians, and so they were basically slaves for this long period of time and working, and Daniel was one of them. If you read the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were all in that too, right? They were all slaves. And so what's happened is these Jews have been purchasing, buying these slaves back. So you've got some slaves that are over in, in Afghanistan or over in Iran, and they're a part of our family. And so we save up a bunch of money and say we can free them by paying for them and buying them back. So, you know, for $200,000, we, we can buy back Jody, right? And so we, we gather up our money and we buy back Jody. Now Jody's back in the congregation. We're all excited. And the next thing you know, she's poor because she's been gone. And some dude over here decides to mortgage her house and take her house and now he makes her a slave to somebody else in the church i didn't free the people so that you could make them slaves in your own church right that's that's his point that's his argument it says when i heard their cry and these charges i was very angry i was very angry nehemiah hears what's going on in the church and he hears how they're treating each other, and he knows it stopped the work of God, and he's like, this really ticks me off, major. This makes me really angry. Now, what would you normally do when something like that happens and you get really mad? You stomp right over, and you get in their face, and you say, bling, 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 bling. this is what I'm going to tell you, and you can't do this, and blah, blah. Let's see how he handles it. Let's see how he handles it. When there's division in the church, a few rich people against the rest of the church, if it says in verse 7, I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. Nehemiah is really, really mad. And so what he does, because he's a good leader, is he stops. He stops. And he cools down. And he thinks this through from all the different angles. Is there anything that's right that they could have done here? You know, how, how were these people that were over here that have mortgaged their families, how are they responsible? What was their side in this? What was this side? And they're trying to work this. He's trying to figure this out. I, I like actually the way 
The new English version says it. It says it, it reads it this way. It says, I mastered my feelings. That's what it reads. I mastered my feelings. I got a hold of my feelings and I mastered them so that I could actually deal with this conflict and I could deal with it rightly. I could deal with it truthfully and I could deal with it the right way. I mastered my feelings. He says, I told him, you are charging your own people interest. So it looks to me like he talks to these people privately. He goes to these people and he says, listen, you're charging them interest? But then we don't see any kind of response from them regarding that. So it goes on, and this is where things get a little bit hairy. Um, He says, so I called together a large meeting to deal with them. All right, now things are getting a little bit carried away, right? So there's a conflict in the church. I'm assuming these people went to their fellow Israelites first, right? These people that are getting ripped off, that are losing their kids, mortgaging their houses. They go to these people and say, hey, stop this, right? You can't do this. We're in bad trouble. This is what the law says, right? And so then what happens? They don't do anything. They don't. So what does he do? He goes to Nehemiah and they go, Nehemiah, you're the leader here. Try to help us figure this out, right? And they explain it to Nehemiah. It looks like Nehemiah then goes and he talks to these people and says, hey, listen, you're charging them interest? Is that really the case? I mean, are you really doing that? Is that really what's going on? This is what the Bible says. And nothing. So now he calls the whole assembly together, everybody together. And you're like, uh-oh. They bring the matter. Now, here's what I've found is that oftentimes when there is conflict, you know who the last person to know is? The pastor. Pastor's almost always the last person to know because nobody wants to know, nobody wants them to know, the, and, and they don't want to bother the pastor, right? Or they don't want to, but that happens, right? The pastor can't help, the elders can't help, leaders can't help, the leader of your ministry can't help if there's conflict in your ministry, can't help if they don't know anything about it. So try to figure it out, and if you can't, then you have to kind of move on from there. And so it goes on. Let's look what it says. It says, um, remember, God's work is stopped because of this conflict. There's no, and this is no longer just a personal issue between that person and this person because it's affecting the work. The wall is not being built in Jerusalem because of this squabble between all these people, okay? So that's not, that's, that, that's, a, that's a public problem now. It's a public problem. It is a church problem. It is a Israel problem. And the moral of the story here is deal with your stuff in private because if it becomes something that hinders God's work, it's, uh, it's going to have to be dealt with in public. That's kind of the moral of the story here. So anyway, Nehemiah confronts the offenders, and though they're wealthy and powerful, he still confronts them. I can imagine Nehemiah's looking at this saying, I mean, these are the people that have all the money. Right? These are the people that have all the power. These are the people that, that control the property of half the people in my church. These people control, control the kids of some of the people in my church. These people have a lot of power. Look at the damage that they've caused. What kind of damage could they cause to me? What kind of, and he, he, but, but he goes forward, right? He's not scared to confront the powerful and the wealthy. In verse 8 it says, And said, As far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to Gentiles. That's what we talked about. They bought them back. And he explains to these guys, he says, listen, I want you just to listen clearly to what I'm saying. In front of everybody, we're all going to look at this. As far as is humanly possible, we've been buying our people back from slavery. Now, you are selling your own people only to have them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued. So it sounds like he was ready for them to make some defense and say, yeah, but, right? Because that's what you always say, yeah, but, right? But he gets rid of the but, and they don't say the but, and they don't have a but, and it just goes forward. And he says, so I continued, what, are you, what you are doing is not right. What you're doing is sinful. You can't treat your fellow Israelites that way. You're, you're destroying the ministry here by what you're doing shouldn't you walk in the fear of god to avoid the reproach of our gentile enemies it's a bad example to those that are outside the gentiles they're looking at this and they're seeing that we've stopped and it's not because of them it's because of ourselves we can't even get along with ourselves what kind of ridiculous thing is that it makes us look bad and because we've been buying these slaves from them You're not just sinning against the ones you're mortgaging. You're sinning against all of us because we didn't buy them back 
so that you could just take them and make financial gain for it. That's not why we purchased these people back from slavery. You're like, all right. He goes on and says in verse, uh, what is this, verse 10, it says, and I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you're charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil, right? That's 1% per month. That's 12% a year is what's being charged on them. Listen, guys. He's always saying, listen, guys, I'm lending them money, all right? My men, they're lending them money. We're lending them food, right? That's what we do because we're family. We take care of each other. We don't look for it as an opportunity to rip each other off and to get richer or to get better or whatever or to steal property. You're hurting them when, you, when they need your help. They need you right now. And all you're doing is, is, is putting a boot on their head and pushing them down. Stop charging them interest. But not just that. He goes on and says, uh, I'll stop doing that. But you also have, it's not just I'll stop doing that. It's you need to undo what you did. You took their house. You're like, well, I'll never take their house again. <laughs> I'll never take another one of your kids from you again. But I'll just keep the ones I got. No, 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 no. What you did was sinful. You need to fix that, right? Give them the house back. You took interest when you weren't supposed to. Give them the interest back. You got the money. You can take care of that. You can do it, right? You should have never done it in the first place. So undo what you did, right? Give them their houses back. It says in verse 12, we will give it back. And now you look at this passage and you go, did they really just say that? They're actually going to do what he said? How in the world can that be? You mean Nehemiah confronted these people, told them what they were doing so was, was sinful, and they actually agreed and now respond appropriately? I mean, to their credit, they didn't defend their sin. They didn't say, well, hey, you know what? Because that's what we always do, right? When you call somebody on something, they know, well, you know, but it wasn't really my fault. It's that person's fault. They did this. Or no, it was that person's fault. Well, really, I, 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 I'm only 2% I'm only to blame, and, they, and they're 98% they're to blame. And then you talk to the other side, and they're like, well, no, I'm, I'm really, the, it's, it's the other way around. And, the, the problem is that we're not, they're not owning it. These people, to their credit, they said, listen, we're wrong. We are wrong. You convinced us we're wrong. It's really important that we take ownership for what we do. It says, then I summoned the priest and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. So yeah, that's not good enough that you said, oh, yeah, I'll do it. Right? That's not good enough. Right? I'm not going to take you at your word on that right? He says, I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out the house and possessions. Any one of you does not keep his promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Watch what just happened here. These people are going to give this back and the whole assembly, not, not just one group in the assembly, not just the people who had gotten ripped off, not just them, but the entire assembly together says, amen. And they're praising God because God is doing something in our midst. And he's making a difference. He says, okay, I'll change. We, we, we say that. We say, all right, I'll change. I, I'm going to make a change. And then a week later, we do exactly what we said we're not going to do no more. Right? And Nehemiah knows that talk's cheap. Talk is cheap. We need accountability to change. And to their credit, again, they're willing to submit to the accountability of their leader, Nehemiah. He says, you know what? Yes, we will be accountable to you. We are really going to do this, and we need some help to do that. And so, yes, we are willing to submit to this kind of accountability, whatever that is. And so they do. It's a really remarkable thing that they're willing to do. And I would say I have a lot of respect for these men, that, though, though what they did was bad. I have a lot of respect for the way they respond to the word of God. When Nehemiah comes to them, they allow God to change and say, you know what, I know that, I'm, I know that I have, I've got some wrong in this and I'm willing to own that and I'm willing to take that for the, for the good of our congregation, for the, good of our, for the good of Israel. Verse 14 says, Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be governor of the land of Judah until his 30th, 
uh, 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brother ate the food allotted to the governor. But their earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and wine. The assistants who lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Watch what it says. It says, it says, it says we devoted, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. That was his concern, not getting out a bunch of money, not getting rich. Nehemiah knows the value of property is going to go up, and Nehemiah's got tons of money, right? He came, he was the cupbearer for the king that sent him, Artaxerxes, right? So he's got plenty of money. He could look at this and say, this is a great opportunity, but he says, no, I'm not going to do that because my concern is the wall. Other governors that had come here, they were charging tax for the people. They were charging all kinds of tax and it was burdening those people. I'm not going to do that to my own people, to burden my own people, even if it costs me personally. He is allotted a certain amount of food just for him. But in order to get that food, he's got to tax the people that are in the congregation. He's got to suck from them. And he knows that's going to be hard, so he doesn't. And it goes on. Watch what it says. It says, it says uh, furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table. So, so not only is he not taking, but he's having some of these Jews, 150 of them, just come and eat at his house on a regular basis because he's trying to take care of these people. This is out of his own pocket. This isn't that he's getting allotted money. This is out of his own pocket, money that he has. He's like, I'm going to help my people because I care about my people. This is a great leader. And what it tells me about Nehemiah, and I, I guess I can close with this. We'll just kind of close up. What it tells me about Nehemiah is that Nehemiah does something that we have to learn how to do a lot better. And that is Nehemiah is willing to give up his rights for what is best for everyone. What's best for the, the, the mission of Jesus, what's best for the mission of sunrise, what's best for the mission of rebuilding these walls is that it's going to cause harm to other people if he demands his rights. Now, he's completely within his rights to say, you know what, I'm the governor and you give me this money. And I don't care that you're going to have to mortgage your homes and you're going to have to do all this. You're going to have to send your kids off. I, I, I don't care about that. I have rights and my rights matter more than you. I got to tell you, that is, I see that in the church all the time. And Nehemiah's going, rights are just there for me to, to take if they, if they work. But, but if they're going to hurt people, if they're going to hurt the mission, I'll be like Jesus, and I will lay down my rights in order to accomplish the mission of God. Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus, he had every right when he, when, he had every right when he was on the cross or when he was being brought to the cross to call on millions upon millions of angels to come down and just smite all the government and just take him away because he had that right, but he surrendered his rights. It says he surrendered rights even to the point of becoming a, a, a person and submitting even unto death, even death on a cross. So what we find in the mature Christian is the person that is willing to submit, to submit to God, to give up their rights when necessary, and say, God, I will, I will follow you even if I don't get everything that I want. I don't get the accolades I want. I don't get, I don't get everything I want. You say, well, jeesh, what does this have to do with Jesus? Well, the internal strife that we're seeing here points to Jesus because the Old Testament temple replaced Jesus by himself. When we see this temple that they're building and the Old Testament temple, right, that's a place where God dwells. They would go to the temple because that's where God is. We can meet God in the temple, right? But when Jesus came, the temple was no longer that. Jesus says, 
tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. So now he's saying, no, the new temple, the way you approach God, the way you enter into God, the way you touch God, the way you meet him is not through this big, huge building. It's through me, right? So we have to understand that's the theology here, right? But Jesus also, as the temple, faced all kinds of division, didn't he? And all kinds of, all kinds of discouragement from who? Who, what, who was after him? Who, was gonna, who wanted to stop the mission of Jesus? His own people. The Romans didn't try to stop him. The world wasn't trying to stop Jesus. The world didn't care one thing. You know who tried to stop Jesus? If Jesus was in the church, it's the people in the church trying to stop the work of God. That's how it always is. And that's how it was then. And you say, well, yeah, but, yeah, but, but now we're the temple, right? And so, yeah, we're going to get sold out. Just like Jesus was sold out by those he loved, who loved him the most. His, his greatest enemies were the people of God, right? Just like it divided and discour- tried to divide and discourage Jesus, the, the church did not, now, now we will be, this will happen to us. And so we look at relationships and we look at struggles and we look at these types of divisions. Jesus faced the same thing. We see these divisions and sometimes we get to the point where we say, you know what? This division is so bad. This division is so bad. The gap between this person and this person or between this group of people and this group of people, it's so bad that that relationship is dead. It is dead. It cannot be revived. It is gone forever. And I want to remind you of something, that that's what they said about Jesus when he was dead. He's gone forever. If you think that, that, that this type of reconciliation comes because you grit your teeth and you're like, okay, well, I'll just make sure. There is the power that raised Christ from the dead that reconciled man to God. It's the same power that rose Christ from the dead. He is no longer dead. Those relationships can be completely and fully alive and flourishing. And so my, my prayer is this, as we're a church, and, and Nehemiah has given this to us today, we're not worried. We're not worried about the stuff last week that I talked about. It's issues, we pray about it, we work through it, we hold on to each other, we hold on to God's word, we stay obedient, but we keep our eye out very closely for what could stop the work. And what could stop the work will be right here in this building. Guard yourself, guard your relationships, guard them closely because the mission of the church depends on it. The mission of the church depends on it. Let's come on, come on. God, thank you so much for, for your word, God. And, and I pray that we would handle this like Nehemiah. God, you give us a great example in Nehemiah of how to deal with struggles. God, and I can tell you, I've had a lot. I've had a lot of conflict in my life. Um, sometimes I've been wrong, sometimes I've not. I've usually been wrong, at least partly. God, I recall times when I sat down with people and I remember sitting in my office one time, God, and you remember it, you were there. <laughs> you remember that, God? <laughs> we were in that room and, and, uh, and I, remember telling, I remember telling this man, this relationship is far more important than the things that we're doing here at this church. This relationship, we have to maintain this. We have to fight for this. God, I remember how you gave us the ability to go through that. God, give us that here. God, I pray that you would help us to to recognize the faults of each other. God, as we move forward, in the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, I pray.